You see this morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. All right, sorry about that. All right. All right, if you have your Bible, show me to Colossians. Colossians chapter number one will be our, excuse me, Colossians chapter three will be our text this morning together. Colossians chapter number three. So if you're joining for us with us for the first time this morning, so we have kicked off the new year by going through a series entitled The Good Life. And so we all live just in desire of the good life, do we not? I mean, you made this year New Year's resolutions. And you probably made those with the idea of this is the year that I'm going to make some huge improvements in my life. This is the year that I'm going to make some progress. This year I'm going to make some breakthroughs in my life. And so you set goals and you set resolutions. And, and oftentimes maybe you meet those goals or maybe you do not. But maybe you meet those goals and you get frustrated. And I think it's because oftentimes when we make goals, and by the way, 70% of our New Year's resolutions revolve around the physical. But yet we reach those physical goals, and yet we still find ourselves maybe a little empty sometimes. And the reason is, again, because you are more than physical. God has created you, as we've seen here in this, in the, throughout the series, God has made you three parts. First of all, he made you with a body. And your body is your physical self. And so we talked about two weeks ago, just this idea of taking care of your body, right? Just implementing exercise. I was talking to my brother-in-law, who is a fitness instructor, and, and he told me, hey, Mike, even 20 minutes, even just 20 minutes in your home can make just breakthroughs in your physical health. Also, we talked about things like, you know, just the food that we eat. And also we talked about just getting proper rest. But you are a body, but also, as we talked about last week, you are a soul. You are a soul. Now, your soul is who you are as a person. It is, it is your mind, it is your will, and it is your emotions. And it's so important in, that, in the negativity of this life. And again, we are prone to negative thinking, are we not? We're, by nature, we're oftentimes can be pessimistic. And in the age of just pessimism, in the age of outrage, it is so unfortunate important that we fill our minds, our souls with positivity. Po what kind of positivity? God. We fill our hearts and our minds. We set rhythms in our lives to steer our wandering souls, our restless souls towards the things of God. And this morning, we'll conclude our series by just talking about your spirit. So if your body is getting your physical self, if your soul is your psychological self, your spirit will then be your spiritual self. And I believe that your spirit is the most important aspect of yourself. It is the one, if you neglect any of these three, you can go ahead and neglect your body, neglect your soul. But to neglect your spirit would have negative consequences, severe consequences. And so we're going to talk about your, your spirit this morning. In order to do that, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 3, and hopefully you're there. We'll be looking this morning at verses 12 through 17. Last week, we looked at verses 1 through 3, which was just phenomenal. I mean, I, I loved verses 1 through 3. I love verse number 2. Look, look at verse 2 again with me. I just, I love it so much. We're going to read it again. It says, set your minds, again, set your souls on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. So set the trajectory of your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions on the things of God, not on the temporal things that are around us, but set them on God. I love that. And then verses 12 through 17, we, we see that built upon. Look at verse 12 with me this morning. It says in verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones. So right there, what he's saying is as God's people. Now, let me be very clear. So when it comes to the spirit, you fall under one of two categories. You are either spiritually dead or, number two, you are spiritually, I hope, alive. Now, if you are spiritually dead, it means that you do not have Jesus. Those who do not are without Christ, they are spiritually dead. But those who are God's chosen ones, meaning God's children, God's, God's heirs, they are God's chosen ones, and thus they are spiritually alive. So what Paul here is saying is, hey, those of you who are God's chosen ones, hey, you are God's children, those of you who know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, hey, he's referring, he's talking to you this morning. 
And so he's saying, hey, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You are holy child of God and you are loved. And because of this, he says, put on these following things. He, puts, he says, put on compassionate hearts. He writes, put on kindness, put on humility, put on meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, he says, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you, almost, you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I love this next verse. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. We'll stop right there. We'll come to verse 16 later on in our, in our message this morning. But just when you read verses 12 through 15 here, do you not just see a list of things that maybe as you set goals and resolutions for 2020, wouldn't it be awesome to have some of these things implemented into your life? I mean, just, just look at some of those qualities again, those, those attributes, those traits. He says, hey, put on as God's chosen ones. He says in verse 12, he says, he says, he says compassionate hearts. I mean, imagine if this year could be the year where, man, you just implement just a more of a care and a love and a concern for other people. Imagine this year, you say to yourself, hey, I'm going to get set outside of my comfort zones. I'm going to step outside of my box, and I'm going to be more mindful towards other people. I'm going to, I'm going to just invest my, this year in just how to be a blessing and encouragement to other people. You have a, a heart of compassion. Uh, you begin to care for other people. Imagine that. I, I imagine this is the year where you have humility in your life. You say, maybe this year, I mean, I've been prideful. I've been, I've been just holding on to things. I've been just trying to live for, for numero uno. And you say, this is the year that I, help, I, I just humble myself before God. And I begin to just, again, live for others and not myself in humility. I just let go of my pride, let go of things that hold me back. And I just begin to embrace, as Christ was, humility in my life. I begin to live surrender to Jesus. Patience, he says. Oh, I need this one now with my kids. So this is the year that I'm going to not lose my cool as easily. This is the year that I'm going to be more patient with my coworkers, my boss, my spouse, my children, my neighbors. I'm just going to live a more patient year this year. This is the year that I'm going to work on my anger. This is the year I'm going to, I'm going to make breakthroughs in the areas of patience. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be more kind as it says it here. This is the year. I'm going to have love in my heart. I'm going to be kind. Some of, you need to, some of us need to underline these things because we're coming on an election year. Oh boy. Oh boy. So we need a really underlying compassion, kindness, and love right there. I love 15. It says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Maybe this is the year that I just am free from anxiety. This is the year that I'm going to be free from stress and worry. This is the year that I'm going to stop trying to manipulate and control every circumstance in my life. Because I, this is the year, in verse 15, I'm going to allow the peace of Christ, not to just to have a peace of my heart, but that, as it says here, to rule in my heart. What does that mean? It means I'm going to allow peace, the peace of Christ, to dominate every ounce of me. That when I feel that I need to be in control, no, 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 no. I'm going to allow Christ, I'm going to trust him, I'm going to rest in him. Now, as I talk about these things, are not these things that we all desire in life? Is it not? I mean, don't we all say, you know what, man, I would, Pastor, I would love to have Christ rule in my heart, man. I would just love that. Man, I would sleep so much better at night. I mean, I, Pastor, I would love compassion in my heart. 
I would love kindness to rule within me. I would just love these things. But yet, we strive for these things. We make resolutions around these things. But yet, why can it be, or why is it so brutally hard? I'll share with you why. We're told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, exactly why it's so difficult. It says here, I'll have it on the screens here for you guys. It says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to you, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So inside of you, what Paul here is teaching in Galatians, it says, hey, you have within you the spirit. And then you, on the other hand, you have the flesh. And they are like going at it within your heart, right? Some of you know this. Some of you face this on a regular basis, right? Like you're being ir you're irritated, right? And you're just upset and, and you know that you should exemplify patience right now, but then you lose your cool and you blow up. And you see just waging inside your heart this idea of, hey, the peace of God and my flesh just wanting to take over. And you see competing within you. What does the Spirit want you to do? It wants you to do the things that were, we listed in verses 12 through 17 here of Colossians 3. But what does the flesh do? Your flesh wants you, is prone to, sides with sin. It sides with sin. And so inside your heart is this war. And in order for us to get victory over these things, the idea here this morning is we must care for our spirits. We must be attentive to and nurture the Spirit of God that is within us. Because if you do not, you will find yourself drifting to the flesh, Christian. Now, the greatest thing, now, what we've done over the last two weeks, uh, this being the third, I, I've showed you how you, I've connected the, the connected your, how you, God created you. Uh, again, you are body, soul, and spirit. And for you to neglect any one of these, you'll find yourself oftentimes frustrated. You, you'll find yourself oftentimes just broken, lost, incomplete. It, it all works together, right? Uh, I've been using the illustration of you take this, the tech team, for example, right? So whenever, it, it just takes, there's a lot of things going on right now. We have a soundboard in the bag. The soundboard then uses a snake to connect to the cords that are up here. Then we use DI boxes up here. And then each singer, musician has is plugged into this box. It's, it's insane what all that goes into it. And then you got the speakers. Now, here's a frustrating thing. If just one cord is acting up, if just one cord is acting or not performing correctly, Every, you, everyone knows it. Like there's a buzz here, there's a buzz there, there's a crickling there, a crackling there. Just one chord that is off messes up the flow of everything. And like manner, since you are body, soul, and spirit, even to neglect one of those throws everything or can't throw everything off. Let me, let me show you why. Last week we talked about the soul, right? So you're, again, your soul is your body, your, your body it is, excuse me, your soul is your will, your emotions, your intellect, your mind, your, 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 your psychological self. But it affects your body, right? Like, let me give you an example. We talked about getting rest. Why don't some of you get rest? Well, because you're up at night worrying about things, right? Maybe you're up at night just thinking about this, thinking about that, worrying about this, worrying about that, and just, man, you would love this idea of rest, but your mind is just so worried about things. We talked about food. You know, some of us, we, we overeat because, well, a number of things, because we're so stressed out, so we find temporary relief from food. Chocolate, right? Our go-to comfort foods, and nothing wrong with those things. I absolutely enjoy those things in moderation, but again, we get stressed out, so therefore we turn to food for momentary pleasures. And, and so our souls affect our, our bodies, and even our bodies affect our souls, right? I mean, if you feel junky in the morning, if you feel terrible throughout the day, then that affects your attitude, which is your soul. And, and so you can see how they just kind of overlap with one another when one of them is out of whack. But your spirit has great influence upon the shaping of your soul. 
Let me show you two passages that point to this reasoning. Uh, first, one's, first one's found in Ephesians 2.1. It says this, Ephesians 2.1. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. So the word quickened there is an old word for it means it means to make alive. So again, I, I talked to you about you earlier that, hey, if you are in Christ, you are spiritually alive. If you are without Christ, you are spiritually dead. Now, Christ, when he comes into your life on faith and trust in him, hey, he, again, the spirit comes inside of you and you are made alive. But what does he make you alive from or what does he save you from? Hey, trespasses and sins. So you are brought alive and thus you are, you are taken away from or you are steered away from sin. Let me show you another passage. It's not on screens here, but it's 2 Corinthians 5.17. If you want to write that down. 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, If any man be in Christ, he is a brand new creature. Meaning what? If you are alive spiritually, hey, you are a brand new creature. Now, what is that referring to? You're a brand new creature. Well, is that referring to your physical self because you don't accept Jesus and, you know, your body starts changing? No, 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 no. But what begins to change is your soul. When you get saved, the Spirit of God comes inside of you, but he begins to bring a change in you. And what changes? The state and the condition of your soul. And the Spirit shapes the soul. Because again, if your, 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 if your soul is, again, your mind, your will, your emotions, then that encompasses maybe how you react to things. It encompasses how you handle things. That's the state of your soul. Your soul, if I can put it this way, is you on autopilot. That's you on autopilot. And so the question is, how are you then programming your soul? Because we talked about this last week, but you on autopilot in your uncurated soul is not good. I mean, how many of you wake up in the morning and say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to get irritated today. Like today, I'm going to just, uh, and if someone says something that I don't like, if someone does something to me that I don't like, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to get irritated. Do you have to tell yourself that? I mean, like, do you have to tell yourself, I'm going to lose my cool today. I'm going to blow up today because, man, I'm just, I'm going to do, that's, I'm, I'm going to blow up today. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. So just one thing that sets me off, I'm going to lose it. I'm, I mean, do you have to say to your spouse, you know what, hon? If you, I mean, if you do one thing that I don't like today, I'm just going to get upset with you. You know what? Just, just, you're laughing because you don't, you see, you on autopilot is not a good thing. Because you, we are hardwired towards selfishness, right? We are hardwired to be prideful. We are hardwired to be arrogant. We are hardwired to look in ourselves for strength. We are hardwired, again, prone towards sin. And so the idea of how do we grow in Christ, why do we need to care for our spirits? Because the spirit begins to reprogram our souls. Do you see how some people are just naturally bent towards, do with the work of Christ, they're just naturally more Christ-like? I mean, some people, they're just prone to grace. Some people, they're just prone to kindness. So, and again, not in their own selves, but why is it that the work of God does a work in their heart, and you find them, and you're like, wow. Like, how are you so, like, forgiving? Like, how? It's because this spirit begins to reprogram their souls, and so the new autopilot program takes over. It's kind of like this. Do you remember when you turned 16 years old and you started taking driver's, uh, driver's um, exams and taking driver's eds and things like that? Man, wasn't that scary? It was for me, all right? Like, I, was t like, I remember being, um, when I first got my, my permit, I remember asking my dad, Dad, how do you keep that big old car inside the lane? Like, I, I just never knew. I was like so, like, I, was, I freaked out about it when I got on the road. I was like, okay, so you got this big old car. Why don't they make the lanes wider, Dad? Right? I remember just freaking out about it. We had a Ford, uh, we, no, we had a Toyota 4Runner, so it was a bigger car. And that's what I used to learn to drive, and I was terrified. I remember just thinking to myself, just coaching myself, okay, 
gas, brake, gas, brake, gas. Like, Dad, what, what happens if you just, like, forget one day and it's all, like, you got a brake, you hit the gas really hard, and just bam, like, I'm just freaking out about driving. Okay, so, so like, you turn this, but what if you turn it too, too hard, Dad? Like, then you hit, like, something. And then, like, then you're driving, like, you got it 10 and 2, 10 and 2. Like, I get in the car, 10 and 2, gas, brake, and I'm just being freaked out about everything. Like, oh, I, I just, but, but now, no, no, no aut automatic right here only. All right. No manuals here. But then I, but then you ever find it interesting how you get in the car, this is kind of scary now, you, you get in the car, you get somewhere, and then you, you get to where you need to go, and then you ask yourself, how did I get here? Right? Is that just me? Right? I mean, you, you get somewhere, right? And you're just like, wait a minute. I put no thought into driving this morning, and I'm here. I didn't cause any accidents that I know of. I mean, I, I, I'm here now, and I, why? Because your body just goes into autopilot, and you just start driving, not even thinking about it. And that's what the Spirit of God has the potential to do in us. It has the potential to change our autopilot, our soul, and to frame it in such a way where we begin to think Christ-like naturally. We begin to just walk in the Spirit and it just becomes who we are and our soul begins to be shaped. How? By the Spirit. And so this morning, I'm going to just give you some ideas and, and just I, uh, tips to just curate your spirit and to point it towards the things of God. The first thing I want to give you this morning is just, it's, and this is real simple, guys. This is nothing elaborate. I, again, I shared with you an illustration this last week how sometimes we want God to work the miraculous, but rather he just gives us the simple. But the simple works. The first thing I want to give you is this morning is get into the word. Get into the word. And here's the reasoning why. Because if your soul shape your spirit excuse me if your spirit then shapes your soul what shapes your spirit your theology your knowledge of god is what shapes your spirit and then what teaches us about god the book that you hold in your hands the bible the bible shapes our belief system the bible shapes our theology the bible shapes our spirit and thus the Spirit then shapes our souls. L let me give you some verses here. The first one is in Colossians 3.16, which we looked at earlier, the passage earlier. So we see all these things now, right? We see kindness. We see uh, humility. We see patience. We see, hey, letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. But how do these things happen? Look at verse 16. It says here, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to god and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ giving thanks to god the father through him but what do we see one of these things is verse 16 let the word of christ dwell in you richly so this is what it's not saying here it's not saying, hey, treat the Word of God like a temporary visit. See, the Word of God in your life, believer, is not meant to be something that comes for a little bit, then leaves. It's not like a house guest. You come for two, three, four hours, and then you leave. No, 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 no. It says, hey, dwell in you. What the word dwell means? It means to make a home in. So the idea here is that we need to allow the Word of God to make its home inside our hearts that the word of God would dwell within my heart and the crevices of it. How does that happen? Well, we see here in Psalm chapter 1, we see what's referred to as the godly man. It says here, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. It means he doesn't listen to all the voices that are around him. He doesn't listen to all the opinions that are here and there and everywhere. Nor does he stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But it says here, but his delight is in what? 
the law of the Lord, the word of God. And on his law, he meditates. It doesn't just meditate once a week on Sunday mornings between the hours of 10 and 11.30. No, no, no. He says he meditates there on day and night. Moving on. He is like a tree. Think of this. Think of the imagery of this. He's like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaves do not wither. It does all, and all that he does, he prospers. The idea here that's painted is the man, the woman who is steadfast in the word of God, he is like a tree. And no matter what comes his way, the winds may howl, the waters may rush. He is firmly planted. He is not swayed to and fro. But he is steadfast and he is strong. And not only that, he is growing. But what does that come from? The word of God dwelling, having its home in his heart. Friend, your time in the word of God has the potential, the power to shape your spirit, which then shapes your soul. Let me give you some illustrations, examples. So if I struggle with stress and fear and anxiety, you know what helps me overcome those things? Knowing and reading in the Bible that I serve and I have a sovereign God who is orchestrating all things, who is in control of all things. See, when I am prone to discouragement, hey, I read about a God, I'm reminded on a regular basis when I read the Bible that I have a God who is in control of it all, and he is not a passive God, but he is an active God who is orchestrating all things. And when I read about that, remind my heart of that, it helps me deal with the stresses of the everyday life. And, and I'm preaching personally here to myself. So this, this week I had several people ask me, Pastor, how was your week? And I typically say the words, I'm blessed. And I really mean that. I'm truly blessed. But if you really want to know, let me tell you, I've had some not so great things happen this week to me. Some things that are prone my heart to discouragement, to be quite honest. And then, but I've also had some great things happen to me this week. Some good things. So how do I deal with it all? I'll tell you, when the not so great things happen to me, when things happen to me that, that steer my heart towards discouragement, you know what I do? I begin to pray, Lord, that was kind of upsetting. That was discouraging. But God, I trust you. God, I, I know that you are doing two things at all times simultaneously. God, I know that you are doing all things for your glory, but also, number two, for my good. And all those things in every circumstance and everything that happens, those two things simultaneously are always happening. And so when I look at things that would cause me to be discouraged, you know what I remind myself? God, you are sovereign. You know what, what, what taught me that God is sovereign? My Bible. My Bible is the thing that taught me that God is sovereign but also the good things. What does the Bible say? Every good thing comes from who? God. So when bad things happen to me, hey, I don't get too discouraged. Hey, when good things happen to me, I, 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 don't, I don't get too jumping for joy. I don't, I stay, I mean, it will say even kill. Why? Because God, every bad thing that happens to me, uh, Lord, I know that you are working all things out. But every good thing, it's not my doing. It's not Mike Bowie accomplishing it. No, no, no. It's God, it's you. It's you. So every good thing and every negative thing that happens to me, everything goes through the Lord. It goes through the Lord. So I'm able to stay just even keel through all things. Now, it sounds perfect. I, sometimes I get discouraged. Sometimes I get a little, little too excited. But all in all, I've learned to just trust the Lord through every circumstance whether it be here as a pastor or as, as a financial advisor, man, it's pressure. But again, trusting the Lord helps you to just keep your mind on him. Trusting God's sovereignty. How about our relational struggles? We all have them, right? 
We all have our relational struggles, whether it be with our spouse, children, friends, family members, etc. So how do we get through our daily relational struggles? By remembering what? That we have a God who loves us. And because God loves us, then we can then love other people. We can then forgive other people. When they hurt us, when they wrong us. Hey, because Christ has first loved me, though I was sinner, though I had transgressed against a holy and righteous God, and I am deserving of damnation, but yet I have a loving God who has forgiven me. What does that remind me then? That I can forgive you. That I can love you as Christ has in love me. But what do I need to remind me on a daily basis that I am loved? Because I don't wake up, my flesh doesn't tell me, Mike, God loves you. That's not my flesh. It is the Spirit of God that has been curated by the Word of God, which then affects my soul. Here's another one. Purpose. When my heart begins to find purpose in other things, when my heart begins to just drift towards hope, towards other things, the Word of God reminds me, whoa! You won't find joy in that. It may bring temporal pleasure, that sin, that, what, that, may be, that may be pleasurable for a season. But Mike, let me remind you of your purpose and you were created for the glory of God. See, the word of God shapes your spirit, which shapes your soul. If I can give you just like maybe a real example here. I was... Um, a couple in our church just celebrated their one-year anniversary back in December, and I was talking with them, and I, and I, I shared this very openly. I, my first year of marriage was a struggle to Amanda. Not because of Amanda, because of me. It was brutal. I mean, if, if you ask us privately, I will, we, we will say to you, I didn't know if we were going to make it that first year. And, and I'll tell you why. It's because I was so selfish. My marriage was not about Amanda. It was about me. And, and thus, when she upset me, it became all about me. When she didn't do something I liked, it became all about what I wanted her to do, what I expected of her. And this, man, the first year and a half, I think, really, is, was, just, was just like, man, it was just like me just sucking the life out of my wife and me just feeding my ego and feeding my pride. It was, it, was, it was not good. Nothing physical, nothing, nothing like that, but just, again, just me being a very selfish and unnurturing husband. But, but what changed? I started reading the Bible more. And, and, and I started understanding that, Mike, you are to love your wife as Jesus Christ loved the church. And, I, and I, I began just really thinking about that. Wait, so I am to love Amanda, my wife, in the same form and fashion as Jesus loves me? And wait a minute, I have offended God again and again and again, and yet his love is relentless towards me. His love is unconditional towards me. His love is just something I don't deserve. And, and, and you mean... I am to love Amanda in that same fashion? I mean, it hit me like a train. And God began to do a work in my heart that Amanda, and all the times that she upset me, was just me being revealed, revealing to myself how sinful my heart is. And then I began to realize, and all those times she upsets me, that is the time I'm most called to be Christ-like in my responses. That floored me. But what was happening in my heart, my theology, my understanding of the Word of God was curating my spirit, was changing my theology, was changing my belief system, which then changed my soul, which then changed the way I started to treat my wife. You see, it all works together. Your belief system will shape you. What you believe about God and what you think about Him 
changes you dramatically. And thus the importance this morning is to feed your spirit with the truth and the word of God. Now, is Mike Bowie still growing? Man, I got a long way to go. But I'm setting habits in my life that my life revolves around the word of God. And I'll be honest with you. I, I tell people this. There are things in my life, I'll be quite honest, where I do not agree with the Bible. I'll be quite honest. But you know what that means? That means Mike Bowie submits his heart, his mind, his intellect that he thinks he has to the word. And the word begins to work in my heart, teaching me and showing me things, which then again affects my relationships. It affects how I treat people. It affects how I live my life. Your theology, your understanding of the word affects you. So number one, again, be a student of the word of God. Be in it. Set patterns in your life where you are reading the word. For myself, again, it is just listening to the word of God. I, I listen to, I have an app called Dwell, if you want to write that down. Man, I, I have this app, I pay like $3 a month for it. Man, I just listen to the word of God. There's free ones out there as well. I just like mine because he has cool accents when they read it, so it's pretty neat. But again, set a pattern where you're just listening, to, where you're reading the word of God. We're just saturating your heart and your mind. And you, you know what the thing is? Some people do, do is they all start off for a week or two and they'll be like, okay, I'm good, I'm going to get this, but then they get fall off in three weeks because they see no big changes. It takes time, guys. It takes time for, the, for your spirit to be just curated by the word of God, but it makes a big change. I, I, I met with a man in our church this week who's just been dealing with different things. And I began, just asked him, how are you filling your mind with the Word of God? And he goes, Pastor, you're right. So I began to share with him some things that I read, and I began to share with him just some, some podcasts I listen to, just where the Word of God is just going to steer his soul, his spirit, which will then affect his soul. And so, again, setting patterns. For you, it could be just, hey, you know what, from the hours of this and this, for the, from, from eight week and 15, 20 minutes, like, I'm going to set this 20-minute time frame you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm just going to allow myself to be in the Word of God during this time, my lunch break. I'm going to just take 15 minutes out of my lunch break to read. I'm gonna, I'll eat real quickly and then get into the Word. And again, I would not recommend that you do it at night because I just find life gets busy. By the time your head hits the pillow, you're just exhausted. Amen, parents? Right? I mean, you're just ready to go. So I just, then may be in the daytime, whatever rhythm you, you can set up yourself. Just take that time to be in the Word. And here's the thing. Do not tell me that you do not have time for the Word. If you have social media, you have time to be in the Word. If you watch TV, you have time to be in the Word. If you sit in traffic, you have time to listen to the Word. If you go to the gym, you have time to just play the Word of God in your mind and in your, in your, through your headphones or whatever. Rather than making excuses why we can't, let's make reasons Give ourselves reasons why we can, how we can. Develop a plan today. Maybe on the way home, talk to your spouse or whoever, your friend, and just, man, how can I make time for the Word of God on a regular basis in my life? Because that will change you over time. But it's not just enough to read the Word of God. Because if we look back at Psalm chapter 1, we'll put that on the, on the screen again, guys, just verse 1 here. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Okay, we get that. Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in a seat of scoffers. But it says here, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law is he meditate day and night. So again, he doesn't just read the word of God, but he meditates on it. What does that mean? He, he muses, he thinks about it. I believe the greatest way that you can think about the word of God is to do this. And this is my second point, to pray the word of God. Don't just read the Word of God because anyone can stand here and just begin reading it. But I believe another effective thing to do is pray the Word of God. So what does that look like? Well, if we take Colossians chapter 3, for example, what we just read early on, I would pray something along the lines of this, Lord, help me to be filled with kindness. Lord, help me to be filled with humility, meekness, and patience. But God, help me do all those things. Lord, by being and in your word. Lord, help me to be in your word. Lord, help me to just read it. 
Help me just cultivate these things in my heart. Why? Because you have loved me. Why? Because you have given me the word and I'm so thankful for it, Lord. Help me just be a student and learn it and grow in it. Do you see? I didn't just read it, but I begin to just pray it, which then more likely will stick with me throughout the day. So many people ask me, Mike, how do I pray? Because I know I should pray, but what do I pray? I really don't know what to pray and how to pray. You know what? Just pray what you got. Just pray what you got. Pray the word of God. Read it and say, you know what? I read that. That stood out to me. That's pretty cool. I like that verse. Pray the verse. Lord, help me to live out this verse in my life. Lord, help me to be kind, patient in my relation. Help me to begin to just pray the word of God. And so I hope I've showed you here just the importance of cultivating your spirit, feeding your spirit, because it will be in your life either the spirit or the flesh, and these two will always wage war against the other. So what does it mean to care for your spirit? It's as simple as this. Just living out your relationship with Jesus. That's really what it is. You see, the Bible is how God speaks to us and prayer is how we speak to God, right? That's really all it is. Very simple. But yet so impactful. And you can just read this book and allow it to penetrate your heart. It will change you. It's changed me. It's changed my marriage. It's changed who I am. I'm not just saying that because I'm a pastor. No, I'm saying that because I'm a Christian. I love this Bible because from it I learn how, how, how loved I am. And from it I learn how sinful I am and how selfish I am. But it reveals to me the answers, the solutions through those things. And that is Jesus. And so again, cultivate your spirit through the word of God, which will then again affect your soul. And your soul is how you think. Your soul is how you meditate. It's, what's, it's, how, it's your reactions. It's, your, it's everything about you. But it, it's all affected by your spirit. So I hope these things will creep into your heart and that you will begin today, tonight, just implementing these things into your life. In fact, one of the things that I do, if maybe you want to try, is I have a journal at home. And every, just about every single day, not perfect at this, but just about every day, this is what I do. I open my journal, and I write down these letters. I write down B, S, O, S, P. B, O, B, standing for body. S, O, standing for soul. S, P, standing for spirit. And the next of those letters, I put down a number. 10 being awesome. Mike, you did awesome. You killed it that day. Zero being, man, you're an utter wreck. <laughs> but I began to score myself. Like, for example, if I ate terribly, if I ate at McDonald's two times that day, then I get like a three for how I cared for my body. If I lost my cool with my kids, then I'll give myself a low score for SO. If the next day or that day I didn't read my Bible, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't spend much time in prayer, then I give myself a lower score for SP, spirit. But in the days where, hey, I did well, you know, I, 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 I went to the gym, I ate well. That day I, I, I was kind to Amanda, I was kind to the kids. Uh, you know, I, I read the word of God that day, I, I spent time in prayer. I, I, you know, I give myself a better score. But what does that do for me? It just keeps me mindful. Okay, the one day I get a bad score, okay, I got to work on that the next day. I, I, uh, one day I got a bad score, okay, th tomorrow I need, I need to work on that, right? And so I'm just being reminding, I'm reminding myself, okay, Mike, you're not just spirit, but you also have a body and you have a soul. And so I'm just challenging myself. I look back the day before, and I just begin to see, all right, I need to work on this, I need to work on that. So what does that do? It just sets habits for myself where I'm just, again, being mindful of who I am and what I need for the next day. So I'm going to challenge you to maybe do the same thing in your life if that helps for you. But again, Taking care of your body, soul, and spirit is so important. But the emphasis is this. It's not so that you can be a better you for yourself's sake. So it's so that you can take care of yourself so that you can better serve other people.
and carry out the mission of God. I do these things not so that I can be happier. I do these things so I can do more for Jesus. I do these things so that I can be a better husband to Amanda. I do these things so I can be a better father to Madison, Jeremiah, and Jackson. I do these things so that I can be a more energetic and more involved pastor in your lives. That's why I do those things. So I can better serve the kingdom of God. Not for my self-help, not for my self-worth, not for my self-promotion, but for the sake of Jesus. So may you, challenge, may you be challenged with these things this morning. Let's pray together, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're new here, this is just what we call our time of reflection.